Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore, where yet again we are delving into the planets of the Imperium with Death Worlds. I don't think I need to explain what the term means. A uh, Death World is a planet that is so inhospitable to human life as to, well, in most cases, cause swift and unavoidable death to any... Uh, amateur that might step upon its surface. Although, that death can take many varied forms. It is a common misconception that death worlds tend to be things like, um, you know, a Katachan, where you'll be eaten by a flower, or a tree, or an animal, or the local human populace running out of food, who knows. But death worlds can be any planet that is unwelcoming to human settlements. Whether or not the inherent danger in spending more than a nanosecond on the planet's surface is related to animals or weather, for example, is in reality irrelevant. Take, for example, a planet that is continuously pelted with high-velocity ice storms, so that you have literal spears of ice flying through the air at hundreds of meters per second. Now, a jagged ice knife might not be a saber-toothed tiger or a catashan barking toad, but if you get in the way of one, you will be just about as dead as if you mess with the other two. And of course, it doesn't even need to be anything quite so dramatic either. You could have a planet that is covered in acidic oceans, which could only be populated via enormous flying platforms. Now, the Imperium does have the technology to do that, but obviously it is going to be ludicrously expensive, and it's going to have to be a ridiculously profitable planet for the Imperium to go to such drastic lengths to try and colonize it. Or, alternatively, it could be a more... <laughs> subtle danger? I remember one particularly neato cheeto little example from the, um... The, the the Death Watch RPG, I believe, where a Tau envoy, envoy party, had discovered a planet that appeared to be absolutely perfect. It was a paradise world, and yet it had no signs of previous colonization whatsoever. There was no signs even of uh, frequent space travel in the nearby area. Apparently, no one had even discovered the planet, or if they had, they had, for reasons unknown, simply bypassed it, not even bothering to do so much as plant a beacon nearby to guide further colonists. It seemed like a Cool, frankly. And so the Tau immediately dispatched a envoy of water cast officials to claim the planet in the name of the greater good. The water cast officials traveled down to the planet and were again amazed by the fact that this apparently paradise like world was completely untouched. In fact, it had oddly little life on it in general, not even a whole lot in the way of base animal life, larger than a, a toad or insects. But nevertheless, yeah, there might be some hiccup in the world's biology. They took off their helmets, breathed deep of the fresh invigorating air, only to have the silence there immediately broken by the first Vortacast member vomiting up his insides. His lungs, to be precise, by the way, in case you were curious. Now, obviously, the Tau aren't complete idiots, and they'd done various scans and tests to make sure that the planet was fine, and there was nothing wrong with the air, because, well, there was nothing wrong with the air. What lived in the air, however, was the problem, as apparently the planet was near completely covered in extraordinarily aggressive microorganisms that, once the water cast member breathed in, immediately infiltrated near the entirety of his body and began eating it from inside. Now, <laughs> how exactly such a ludicrously aggressive and ferocious microorganism could exist just hanging out in the air? Well, that's going to be one of the many uh, mysteries of 40k. But the point remains, this was most obviously a death world, and colonizing it was going to be challenging, even for the Tau. Yet other planets were made into death worlds rather than being originally created or discovered to be such. Krieg is, of course, one of the biggest, most famous examples of this. As I mentioned in my Krieg video, the planet was originally quite the paradise. 
It strikes me that GW has a certain perverse interest in turning paradises into hellish death planets, but oh well, details, details. In the case of Krieg, of course, it was turned from a nice, pretty little place to live to a desolate wasteland covered by irradiated deserts by an enormous nuclear holocaust launched by the last loyalist survivors on Krieg during the uprising to, uh, you know, level the odds. Though again, bear in mind that even man-made measures need not necessarily be quite so over the top. It worlds that were once decent planets to live on could be turned into death worlds by simply polluting the atmosphere for the last ten odd thousand years. Uh, forge worlds, for example, are often qualified as death worlds in addition to forge worlds because very little is able to live in, you know, smog so thick you could carve it with a spoon. But just like in the case of the Forge world, abandoning the planet obviously is not really an option. Now, in the Forge world example, the reason for not abandoning the planet is because of the enormous complexes you've already built upon it. Complexes that will probably already have been over the millennia that has presaged the now rather dire climatic conditions, been hardened to withstand them and protect the working populace of the Forge world against the literally measurable in inches thick smog. Whereas on many other planets, the reason why the Imperium would like to stay, no matter the hazards to its populace, and frankly, do you think the Imperium cares? <laughs> it usually has to do with things like resource riches. Certain planets, for example, might have access to a particular metal that is useful in the manufacturing of particular weapons, or even component parts of weapons. Other planets might even have created the unique circumstances required to produce nearly unique metals in and of themselves. Like a, uh, a type of crystal, for example, that acts as a much better focal lens for high-powered LAS weaponry. Or a superconductive material that makes cogitators far more intelligent and faster, or a billion other things. Other worlds simply have abundances of natural raw resources. If you could plunk down a mine on a death world and then continue to produce high-grade iron for... 10,000 years, then really, if a few hundred people are eaten each year by the local vegetables, it's kind of a small matter, actually. And we also need to um, delve a little bit deeper into the precise definition of a death world here, because, as I mentioned, it is a planet that is challenging to colonize. That does not mean impossible, it can in certain circumstances, absolutely, but there are death worlds with relatively sizable population centers. The aforementioned um, factory worlds, forge worlds, for example, would be one. There are other hive worlds, like Krieg, with fairly sizable populations, or even more regular hive worlds that have simply rendered their atmosphere um, less than healthy due to using it as a dumping ground for varial chemical runoffs, stuff like that. Whereas other planets may have been populated in the distant path, such as the example of Fenris, which is today used primarily as a recruiting world for the Space Wolves chapter. And indeed, there are many planets that are desirable not for the raw resources, but specifically for the kind of men that the planet produces. As we can see from many of them being chapter homeworlds. Hard stock for the finest Adeptus Astartes. Planets like Cretacea for the Flesh Terrors, or Baal for the Blood Angels, or again Fenris for the Space Wolves are all excellent examples of this. Certain other chapters, like the Ultramarines, even go so far as to semi-simulate such environments as a test of fortitude and endurance. The race to the Fortress of Macrag, for example, takes the would-be recruit through some pretty goddamn awful terrain, barefooted wearing only a kilt, obviously, to make sure that they've got the metal required to join the mighty vanilla marines. <laughs> 
Though, again, the, uh, God, the exceptions really lay thick around Death Worlds, don't they? As it's not always Space Marines either. Krieg is an example of a more large-scale production of fighting men, but Katachan is probably the best example of hardier stock. The men of Krieg are ridiculously tough mentally because they have been literally born, raised, and bred, essentially, to become fearless soldiers. Whereas the Katajan jungle fighters, well, they have seen pretty much the worst shit that Galaxy can throw at them, so they're not going to be running away anytime soon either, but they are primarily valued for their natural ferocity, their ability to take on the countless horrific life forms on their planet and kill them all with a shotgun, or a combat knife, or the occasional frag grenade if they're really big and nasty. One final reason as well for occupying a death world might be that the planet is of particular strategic importance. Say for example that it uh, lays astride the only stable warp route in a region. Now you could easily argue that it would be better to build a space station around it, but well, Space station is goddamn expensive. Uh, people, however, and prefabricated shelters are really, really cheap. And if you ever need to, you know, replace the population numbers, just encourage them to outbreed the uh, eating rates of the local animals or whatever hazards exists on the planet. Obviously, if you'd want to fortify the plates more, then space stations would be more intelligent again, but economy really is a genuine concern, even in the Imperium of Man. Um, research outposts would be another example, as this is the thing. It is a common misconception that the Imperium has no technological progress whatsoever. This is not correct. The Imperium is continuously carrying out various reverse engineering projects, for example. They're also trying to develop new technology. The thing is that they are basing all of this in already existing technology. In essence, they're not trying to figure out a new way to do something. They're trying to figure out the old way to do something, if, if that makes sense. Essentially, they are working from the assumption that the solution on how to uh, turn piss into water, you know, pure drinkable water, etc., yeah? which they probably have know the answer to already, to be fair, but it's just an example. Calm down, okay? <laughs> they, they would assume that the secret to doing so lies in the past, which means that hints to it might lie in STC blueprints or ancient devices, for example. And they would then have to study them, piece together the various little hints and technological scraps here and there to create the device they're actually aiming to create. Whereas from our perspective, we would go, all right, what's the problem, and then engineer a solution the Imperium goes from the solution and then tries to mix and match together the pieces they, are, they already know to create the final product, if that makes sense. But this often means that they need to carry out lengthy archaeological digs, for example. And those are not always in the most pleasant of climates, to be sure. It also means that on occasions they need to study live specimens. There are even certain bioweapons created from animals in use in the 41st millennium. I can only imagine that the Magos biologists would be quite interested in trying to recreate the miracle of nature that is the Katachan barking toad, for example, though the dangers inherent in even attempting to study that thing will probably have uh, precluded any real attempts. And even if they hadn't, I imagine the local populace would have taken the shotgun solution to the problem. A lot of makers biologists that suddenly just go missing on planets like these, but considering the hostility of the locals... <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the local wildlife and flora, of course. That is hardly surprising and doesn't really raise all that much in the way of eyebrows, frankly. As the population on these worlds are obviously equally hardy. As mentioned, the people themselves become a pretty significant resource because staying alive on a death world... <laughs> It requires a fair bit of um, 
investment in the project, shall we say. Even on the more placid death worlds, where there are no enormous T-Rexes capable of breaking down plasteel walls, where all you have to do is fight off the environment, life is still harsh and difficult. Let's take the, the best case scenario, right? The Forge world. You are provided with a hab block. That Hablock will already have been shielded and protected against any and all of the dangers that might arise outside of its walls, or most of them anyways, to the point where you will live a relatively long life. Even in these cases, you can never go outside. You're going to have to live your entire life in a series of differently sized boxes. You are going to get your food in a box. You are going to eat it in a box. You are going to prepare it in a box. You are going to sleep in a box. You are going to make a family in a box. You are going to do every single solitary action of your life in a box. Because the moment you step outside, you will be dead. And if the box was ever to breach, you would also be dead. And speaking of things like food as well, on many of these worlds, um, nutrient can be difficult to acquire. In the case of a forge world, you're probably going to be eating recycled humans a lot of the time, or mushed up and refined agricultural products, grind down into a paste, which have then been given various additives to make it more nutrient, whilst making sure that it is also completely and utterly unappetizing. <laughs> Perhaps rather than death world, we should simply refer to these as hell worlds. Meanwhile, if you're living in a more um, precarious world, with giant dinosaurs and T-Rexes and saber-toothed tigers the size of 18-wheeler trucks, you've got a whole different set of things you need to worry about. In this case, you don't live in a box. You can go outside, so long as outside is in a massive fortified compound surrounded by sentry guns and eagle-eyed guardsmen. Least a petrodactyl or something swoop down from the heavens and snatch your baby right out of your arms. Good news for the petrodactyl, but usually negative news for the family. Although oh, they might have grown so blasé about it at that point that they'll simply just turn around and make another. Who knows? But walls, of course, can only protect you for so long. Sentry guns will only work so long as they have bullets inside of them, which means you need to set up manufacturing systems. You need mechanics and engineers to maintain everything. The walls need to be constantly reinforced and upkept, as various animals try to dig their ways either through it, in the case of the more, uh, ridiculous species, or underneath it, which, whilst more of a roundabout way, would provide just as big of a threat to the local community, after all. They might also need to fix up the weaponry if some of it is destroyed. They need to continuously produce the ammunition or recharge the power packs. And then of course there's the problem of actually finding food. Now agriculture would seem like the obvious solution, but humans require a stupid amount of land to feed themselves. Which means that if you've got a sizable community and you were going to live purely off agriculture, you are going to need ENORMOUS walled or fenced off areas. Bearing in mind too that what humans consider food will probably show up on the menu of the local super herbivores as well. You know, the ones that have grown so large the carnivores literally can't eat them anymore. Yeah. And if one of those begins wandering around your tomato garden, you're unlikely to have many tomatoes left by the time it finishes. The only way to stop this is either with even more enormous walls and even more sentry guns, which grows remarkably uneconomical at one point, or alternatively, culling the local populace. This is a vitally important task when you're surrounded by carnivores. You need to try and make sure that their population doesn't begin spiraling out of control to the point where they begin eating all of the herbivores, and then looking towards your walled compound and going, well, it's better than starvation, charge. And so you gotta keep the numbers under control, which might also bring in a healthy source of meat, depending upon the planet. There are other death worlds where the animals themselves are literally toxic, to the point where not only can they not be eaten, but merely being around them will be dangerous and eventually lethal to human beings. Though ironically that would actually increase the need to kill the damn things to clear a decent perimeter. Which of course leads us to the natural question, how exactly 
Do you kill a T-Rex the size of seven hab blocks stacked on top of one another? <laughs> well, that uh, is another aspect of the average death worlder. They're quite handy and ingenious, they've got to be, and extraordinarily determined, because on a death world, your life is simply one very large problem. One that the planet is probably trying to solve by turning you into compost at some point. It is a continuous, never-ending struggle for simple survival. If you're not fighting against the climate, you're fighting against the fauna. If you're not fighting against the fauna, you're fighting against the flora. If you're not fighting against the flora, you might be fighting against your fellow human beings over scarce resources and preferable farmland lots. Take uh, Fenris again, for example. Fenris has an enormous culture of raiding. On that planet, it is because the land itself is not actually particularly stable. Every single island on Fenris is connected to the countless enormous tectonic plates underneath the planet, meaning that uh, for some time, an island will remain an island, and then eventually it will begin sinking beneath the waves again. Sometimes slowly, sometimes more, um, <laughs> surprise, you're underwater now, kind of style. This obviously means that various tribes will compete fiercely over the largest slices of lands, particularly those that have been above the waves for so long as to maintain some sort of decent agricultural produce capabilities. Those who have trees as well. And many of these lands too are scattered across absolutely ridiculously enormous oceans, to the point that there are probably thousands if not tens of thousands of islands that have been stable for decades, centuries, maybe maybe even potentially millennia, that have simply never been found, because to find them, you need to venture out on a completely blind voyage, with no real navigational tools, because you don't know where you're going, in a longboat, on a sea that is heavily populated by sea monsters. <laughs> Hell, even, even if you manage to find something, Getting back is going to be almost as difficult and definitely as dangerous as actually getting there in the first place. And in many cases, entire tribal societies are forced out of their lands by hostile raiders and sent out as, well, de facto wanderers, sailing across the globe of Fenris in hope of discovering some untapped land resources somewhere. In many cases, these people will then turn into the raiders themselves, unsettling some society here or there that have grown a bit too lax, a little bit too soft over the preceding years, and will now become easy prey for those who are cold, hungry, and in search of a home. And speaking of those three attributes as well, these are obviously very desirable attributes for many of the Imperial Guard's more ferocious regiment, and the Space Marines themselves. The ability to survive in almost any environment, through sheer bloody-minded determination, grit, and survival know-how, is very, very valuable indeed to any fighting formation. And if the troopers also happen to be accustomed to fighting spiders, the size of forged feats with nothing more than a spear and a torch, well, imagine what they could do with a lasgun and a bayonet. Then again, I also fondly imagine there are death worlds where the local populace have simply said enough of this shit and turned themselves into monsters themselves. Imagine the aforementioned example, right? You live on a planet. The top of the planet is constantly burned to a crisp by a nearby failing star, like it's pelting it with radiation every second of every day. Five minutes on the surface will leave you nothing more than a charred, scorched skeleton. So the only way to survive is obviously underground, deep underground where the local populace, who were busy digging out unique and interesting natural resources, happened across an army of enormous spiders that decided that humans were small, soft, pink, and absolutely goddamn delicious, and thus set about reducing the population in order to you know, feed their children. 
I would like to add here that the spiders would probably capture some of them, drag them to the nests, and then feed them to their children whilst they still live, just for the extra, you know, hate the boobs factor. So eventually, the local populace, realizing that they are in possession of enormous quantities of mining high explosives and other such devices, decided to build themselves armored mining rigs with flamethrowers and grenade launchers and shit, and just wander down into these tight and narrow corridors and tunnels, spewing fire and frag in front of them. That could be actually a genuinely really interesting sort of uh, of heavy infantry formation, you know? But every soldier is super heavily armored, and he carries some sort of, uh, sort of? Some sort of close range weaponry, an enormously oversized shotgun perhaps, flamethrowers, grenade launchers, melter guns. Because, you know, some of the spiders are really, really, really large, and frankly, laugh at anything lesser. And hell, you wouldn't even necessarily need the monstrous arachnids. Remember that Terminator armor was originally designed for hazardous work inside of spaceship reactors. And so surely, living on planets with uh, inclement climate conditions like lethal radiation or ice storms might also require some fairly heavy-duty protection. In sharp contrast to the Katachan jungle fighters, who you've been seeing little pictures of throughout this video, who are instead lightly dressed because, well, they live in a sweltering jungle environment. Plus, I imagine the leeches on the Katachan are the kind of things you'd like to get rid of ASAP. So really, only the imagination places a limit on what a death world could be, and the kind of problems that it might present to a population, and the kind of solutions the daring survivors might happen upon to stay surviving. And with that, I'll wrap up this video. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon with more 40k and Warhammer lore. Until then, have a good day.